welcome back. We're in our uh, series here about uh, owning recreational land. And uh, today's topic is uh, improving uh, that property. So once you have the property, uh, what are you doing to improve it for, uh, for your enjoyment uh, and for, uh, for the long term? So uh, when we bought the property here, uh, as we've mentioned in prior uh, episodes, we bought 70 acres and then we added 80. Uh, the original 70, uh, we, you know, we were uh, doing a number of things on it to enjoy it. We bought the 80. Uh, which has uh, been neglected for many, many years uh, past strip mine uh, land. And so uh, we started right away with some efforts to try to improve it. Uh, obviously, as uh, hunters, one of our goals was to try to uh, optimize it for, for deer hunting. Uh, but we've kind of evolved in our, our understanding of uh, what it means to, to improve land. And so uh, Jason's going to share our, our mission statement. You know, what, what is our goal here to improve the property? And then we're going to talk about some of the, the different agencies that we worked with that have made it possible and actually led to our first conservation award that we just received uh, this past November. Right. Yeah, so as, as we were talking about the what we call the Habitat Oasis Project, we really sat down and gave some thought to what's our ultimate goal with this property? You know, what's our mission with this property. And what we came up with was a mission statement to be good stewards of the land by leaving it better than we found it and returning the property to a native habitat oasis that wildlife love. And the root of that was you know, the, the native habitat. As we purchased the property and learned more about it, we quickly learned that it had a lot of invasives on it. And that was a result of some mining that had happened on the property back in the 70s. So the property had been reclaimed at that point to the current standards. It's covered in invasives and the reality is it could be much better habitat. So we've decided we're gonna take it upon ourselves to return it to you know what it should have looked like before it was originally strip mined. So before we, uh, before we started to, to tackle that piece, we brought in a, a timber consultant to, uh, to look at our uh, timber on the front 70 to build a basis for us that uh, established the value of that timber and to uh, work with us to put together a, a bid to, to put out to the local uh, loggers and mills uh, to sell some, to, to do a select cut. And why we wanted to do that, uh, two, twofold. One, uh, there's some revenue potential in there, some money to, to put back towards the, the purchase of the property uh, and some of the equipment we've been buying. But it was uh, beautiful woods. Uh, Kelly and I, when we walked these woods, we looked through them and thought, man, this is uh, wide open. You could go anywhere you wanted, tall canopy, and, uh, you know, this is great. You know, no briars, nothing. Well, when you think about deer hunting, they like to browse and eat all of that stuff. They like to follow the cover in the woods, and we had no cover. Uh, the property had never been uh, timbered. So the first project that we took on was a select cut on the front 70, and uh, on... Uh, I think it's about 60, 55 to 65 acres of timber. Um, I think we took off uh, around 328 trees, I think. And so um, that's not a lot when you think about it, four or five per acre. Um, so uh, that was the first step to, uh, to improve the, the habitat, to improve the health of the woods. Uh, and by using a, a certified forester who was interested in improving the overall um, woods for, uh, for Ohio, uh, he helped us, you know, do some crop release. You know, we'll take these trees out here to improve these trees down here that will have better market value in the future. Um, so it was a very positive first experience uh, with, with uh, not necessarily an agency, but our first uh, consultant that we brought in. Yeah, and when you think about a consultant, I mean, the first thing you think about is, you know, how much does that cost? And, you know, part of what we wanted to do was we want to improve our property as much as we can without incurring you know, as much cost as possible. So, you know, how can we do it as cheaply as possible? How can we le leverage resources that uh, we don't have to pay out of pocket for? And we were fairly new to trying to manage a large parcel property. And one of the neighbors had told us that, hey, there's some programs out there through the Department of Natural Resources where they'll actually, you know, pay you and, and help finance some of these. So we started doing some research on the Ohio Department of Natural Resources website. And what we came across was what they call Ohio private land biologists. 
and I located the biologist for our county. I reached out to her and made arrangements for her to come out and really just told her, you know, we'd just like to take an initial look around and see what we've got. So we scheduled time. She asked me if uh, I would mind if she brought along a forester. And obviously, you know, any resource we could get access to, we were interested in taking advantage of. So she reached out to the local soil and water conservation district and got their forester to come out with her. And the two of them came out and started walking the property with us, giving us some uh, tips on, you know, little things we could do, big things we could do, and really just letting us know, you know, the current condition of our property. That, you know, here are good things, here are things you want to think about, talking a lot to us about goals. And they gave us some ideas with really a plan to return in, I don't know, it was four or five, six months. They wrote up a kind of a small plan for us of, you know, here's what I saw, but said, let's come back in five or six months and see what you've done and we'll continue to make recommendations. So, you know, the first step was looking through Ohio Department of Natural Resource website and we'll include the link in our description so you know how to get a hold of those biologists. We've been real pleased with them. But that got us, ODNR got us in touch with uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. And from there, you know, the relationship started spreading. So, yeah, so Jason's done a lot more of the, the outreach to the, uh, to the agencies than I have. I did a lot of the upfront research and, and identifying different programs um, that were of interest. And, and he put a lot of that into, uh, into action just by getting people here. I'm gonna steal a little bit of probably the, one of the points that you had brought up. It's not an agency, but a, a resource that we leverage, which is the Habitat Podcast. Um, and so there's uh, the number one podcast out there for Habitat uh, management is called the Habitat Podcast. You can find it on any of the podcast platforms. And uh, we've gotten to know Jared and Brian, who run the podcast quite well. We've both been uh, guests on there. And I'll let Jason talk about his kind of um, appearance on there and what he covered. But I think the net of it that I'll, I'll point out is we went into kind of fact finding and learning mode. <clears throat> and found this as a great resource that exposed us to a, a number of experts in the industry uh, that changed us from food plotters to habitat managers from a mentality perspective. And to hear somebody like Dr. Craig Harper from uh, the University of Tennessee uh, distinguish the difference you know, was very impactful. Jason listened to most of these, came back, kind of told me you know, how his how he had evolved in his thinking. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that just sounds like fancy talk for we're going to do more food plots. <laughs> um, but I had an opportunity to listen to, I listened to about 15 or, or 20 of these podcasts on my way down and back uh, to Florida. And um, it really was inspiring uh, and enlightening. You know, everything that we thought we knew, and we really didn't know that much. So what we thought we knew was nothing. Uh, and, and what we came away from these, uh, each of these hour episodes was a, a significant step uh, forward in a, in a different direction than we had ever considered. Yeah, I think the, the, the timeline is interesting because we had the ODNR, the biologist and the forester out in um, 2018, uh, actually into 2017. And we spent 2018 doing some work on our own, uh, just trying to implement the things we were learning from them, but we were still really focused on, you know, cleaning up area and putting in food plots. And it was really, you know, food plots, some apple trees, you know, some very basic items. And it was, I found the Habitat podcast when I was on vacation and had a lot of time in the car and I started listening to it. And it really did, that was in uh, July of 2019. It really shifted my thinking that, um, Josh mentions Dr. Craig Harper, and you know, the idea of, you know, every year I can go out and plant three acres of beans or I can establish three acres of native plants that will self-seed themselves and provide deer with the nutrition that they would like to see on the land anyway, that are, that are native plants. And you won't pay for that every single year. You might have to do some maintenance to it, but it really changes the model. And it got us looking at, you know, what else can we do? So, you know, as, as this is playing out for us, we're hunting, we have trail cameras, and uh, one of the things we got a picture of, we got a picture of a, a feral hog. So we've got a few in southeastern Ohio. The goal is to eradicate them. We got a picture of it. I shared the picture with the neighbor, and the neighbor actually reached out to the USDA and reported it to them. Within a couple of days, I got a call from uh, 
uh, the individual who's responsible for that program asking, can we come out and do some work on your property to try to lure this thing in so we can get rid of it? So that was our first introduction to the USDA. We started working with them. They were unsuccessful in getting that particular hog. We kind of determined that it was passing through, but he knew that they were in the area. He was already working in the area. Uh, but that got us in touch with the USDA. And from there, we got further into USDA as we started exploring uh, other programs to improve the property. And that's where we got into the EQIP program. And there's, there's a lot of people that have been involved in different government programs with different uh, perspectives on them. Uh, there's a lot of people that feel like, you know, it's a lot of government red tape. Uh, our experience with the EQIP has been really positive. We had things we planned on doing anyway. We wanted to remove autumn olive. We wanted to uh, plant uh, fields that, that had native warm season grasses. There was a lot of things we wanted to do. And what we found was that there was a lot of overlap between what we wanted to do and what the EQIP program would provide cost share for. So we were able to set up an EQIP agreement that, that we could do the projects we already wanted to do. They put a little bit of structure around them in terms of when they would happen and some key requirements that we had to meet that uh, if you're going to get a government payment, you're going to have to meet some guidelines. I mean, you know, if, if you're completely uh, freaked out by the fact that someone's going to want to come back and inspect that you actually remove three acres of, of autumn olive, the program is probably not for you. But if you recognize that uh, I'm doing that work and it'd sure be nice to put $500 in my pocket for work that I already planned on doing, um, it's a great program. So we've had some good success with it. Um, you know, Josh has been pretty involved with uh, Equip as well as me, so I don't know if you have stuff you want to add about Equip. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm sure you'll fill in some of the details on the on the 80 as part of my timber management plan. That helps me qualify for CAUV, as we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, that plan included a lot of uh, instruction to remove invasives, and so Ohio is, um, as is, are many other states the oak forests are being depleted and overtaken with less desirable uh, you know, trees like you know, maples, red maples, things that grow fast and shade out the oaks. And so I got into a three-year oak equip program that was really about going into my woods and getting rid of uh, barberry, uh, grapevines, and autumn olive. And I think privet was the other invasive and basically going in and, and, you know, eradicating that stuff or cutting it back and treating it, controlling it so that the other uh, plants could, could have uh, room to grow. Jason mentioned, you know, 500 bucks in your pocket. I think I got about 13 or 1400 this past year. Now I put about 30 to 35 hours on 25 acres and I will, I've evolved in how I'm going to address it. But you know, I've just signed up for another three years to continue to hit the other parts of the property. And, um, you know, part of my concern when it came time to do the inspection was, did I, did I get enough of it? Did I get the right boundaries? Did I do the right stuff? And uh, the, the DNR forcer that came and walked it with me was fantastic. He's like, hey, if you think I, get, I showed up here thinking that you had eradicated an invasive, um, you know, Good luck, right? That's never happened before in the history of my of my job. And so, you know, we walked, we found places where we had re-sprouts, we found some, some areas where I missed some things. Uh, some, he helped me identify Tree of Heaven, a few other invasives that I didn't know were there and, and marked them and uh, a great partnership. I mean, I, it, it's amazing when these guys come out, you know, we, we spend a couple hours with them uh, and just soak up as much information as we can. So my experience with Equip, uh, which we we worked through the um, the USDA in our in our CS group uh, to to uh, register in that, and then the uh, DNR works with them to to do the um, the follow up. Everything about it has been positive, and uh, you know highly recommend you know if you're going to do the work and it's cost share, so you don't even have to do it yourself. You could pay somebody else to do it and not put any any money in your pocket, but. You know, I spent, like I said, 35 hours climbing the hills, treating stuff. Uh, it was hard work, but I was outdoors, and uh, that's part of our, our hobby is being outdoors in yeah. all seasons. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to get into some of the details of projects that we did, and it, just the simplicity of, of the, using the program, Autumn Olive was on our list. We knew we wanted to remove Autumn Olive. 
if you think about an autumn olive bush, it's you know 12 or 15 feet tall and 12 or 15 feet wide. It's a huge bush. You're going to cut that thing off at the uh, at the base, and you've got an entire tree you need to do something with. So we were going to get paid to remove the autumn olive. Well, what are you going to do with that treetop now? Well, you're probably going to pile them up somewhere. Well, guess what? There's a program for creating wildlife habitat that is all about building brush piles. So as we cut them, we piled them, which we were going to do anyway. And the result was we got paid to cut them and we got paid to pile them. And what we ended up with was an area that has 20 some brush piles that provides habitat for songbirds, uh, ground nesting birds, uh, rabbits. The deer will tend to browse around them that it provides, it breaks up that open field so they've got some cover. But it's, it's just two programs that work hand in hand and we got paid for both of them. Uh, we had uh, a lot of invasives, uh, Cerecia lespediza. We always have to work Cerecia lespediza into our videos. That's his, that's his uh, drinking word. So if you're watching, drink. Yeah, he said exactly. Cerecia. Uh, so Cerecia lespediza is all over the property. We got paid to apply herbicide to remove that. So it was something we wanted to do anyway. We wanted to plant trees. Well, as Josh said, you can pay somebody to do some of this work for you, or you can do it yourself and pocket the money. We were able to take the money from building brush piles and use that to buy trees, or, and it didn't cover the full cost of trees, but it paid for part of the trees. The tree planting actually gives us some money as well. So the cost of planting those trees has been offset significantly by those programs. We needed to uh, plant some other habitat, and I found an organization called the BM Butterfly Habitat Fund. They provide free seed to plant pollinators for honeybees and monarch butterflies. So I planted a total of four acres. Uh, I've got two acres of clover in, and I've got two acres of pollinators that are going to get planted here in the next couple weeks. But they provided free seed. That seed would have cost us several hundred dollars. Uh, we got it for free. We planted it as part of our EQIP program, and EQIP will give us money to, for doing that. So that helps offset the cost of herbicide that we use to prepare the area, diesel that we use for planting, uh, mowing, a lot of costs that were offset. Uh, last thing that I'll hit, we've, we've got, our, our contract has a lot of things in it. Edge feathering. It was something we wanted to do just to create environment along the edge of the woods. And we'd already done a bunch of edge feathering before we got into EQIP, but now we've got an EQIP contract that will pay us for dropping trees along the edge of the field and creating more habitat. So. The EQIP program, the USDA has just, it's been great for us and it's something that, you know, we'll continue, now that we understand it, we'll continue to look at, you know, what other, what other individual projects are there within EQIP that we can leverage, that we already plan on doing, and, uh, and help cover the cost of. So EQIP has been, uh, the USDA has been a, a good organization uh, for us to work with. So I think uh, the net of all of this is, you know, if you enjoy being outdoors and you want to improve your property, which many of you, you know, are habitat <laughs> managers or hunters or fishermen or, or just landowners that want to be outdoors, there are a tremendous amount of opportunities to um, leverage other agencies for knowledge, for cost sharing programs. Uh, there are nonprofit organizations to reach out to in addition to your state, local and federal agencies. Did I mention earlier that we got a conservation award from our work? I don't think I did. I don't think you did. So uh, in November, we were recognized by the, uh, the local soil and water conservation district for uh, cooperator of the year. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we'll call it, we call it kind of the accidental <laughs> conservationists because we didn't set out to win any kind of awards. In fact, um, you know, we just set out to kind of offset and, you know, some of our expense and learn more and accelerate what we were doing. Uh, and I think we achieved all of that with the help of, uh, of a lot of other people who, who uh, brought us knowledge and, and collaborated with us. And you know, we, we leveraged some Facebook groups that we talked through, Habitat Chat, Habitat Managers, a couple of them that we leveraged and, uh, and gotten to know the folks out there. So, um, you know, it's possible to do it. It's possible to get paid for doing the stuff that you enjoy doing. Uh, the improvement's going to come along with uh, both short-term gains in your, uh, your enjoyment of the property, but also long-term gains you know, for whomever you might leave the property to and who they might leave it to down the road. So um, lots, of, lots of available resources. You just got to tap into them. 
Um, well, a good place to start is your, your Department of Natural Resources for whatever state you're in, your uh, USDA NRCS team, you know, hit their websites, give them a call, see what's available. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I, I think one of my big tips is, I see this on Facebook, don't let one person's bad experience convince you that you should not look into these programs. I see people post and, and they'll talk about how bad the, the government oversight is on these and, you know, I hated this and this. We have had such a positive experience with it. Don't let one or two people that didn't have a great experience, and there's all kinds of reasons that it may not have been good, um, you know, check them out. There's so much benefit to them. You're really missing an opportunity at access to resources that you don't pay out of pocket for. So take advantage of what's out there. There's a ton of help available and uh, we're thrilled that we've used them. Yep. So uh, if you enjoy this content and uh, you know, hit that like and subscribe, share it with your friends, hit that bell notification beside the subscribe button so you find out about our other videos. Uh, we've got links in the description and uh, you know, we appreciate you coming back. We appreciate you watching. And uh, as we like to say, outdoors is always in season. So uh, find something to get you outdoors. We're outdoors all the time. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you.